568-1200 is our number. It's a recent story, and it's one that really has people wondering what actually happened. Well, the family is saying the story that's been told is not the accurate one, and so they filed a lawsuit. Now, legally, what, would that, what does that mean? We're going to explore those options um, on, on, on this day with, a, with uh, one of our favorite uh, attorneys. But first, let's go to the story. Was it suicide, or did police investigators drop the ball? Now the defenders learning the family of Joanne Matuk Romain filing this lawsuit, hoping to get more information in court. This is the lawsuit just filed by attorneys representing the Matuk family. Gross Point Farms and Woods Police, the target of the lawsuit. Joanne Matuk Romain's children believe the investigation was botched and there may be a cover up. She was a loving, devoted mother um, and she was not at all suicidal. She lived for her family. A defender investigation revealed potential issues the family had with the police investigation witnesses who may have been overlooked, concerns about the condition of the victim's clothing and body, and why would someone take their own life walking into shallow water in the middle of winter? And before disappearing, Joanne Matuk Romain allegedly told her children someone may be after her. She had felt the sense of, of being followed, you know, just someone watching, kind of getting a routine down. Now, after years of searching for answers, the family deciding to take legal action, hoping to get access to more crucial information. The police very quickly determined that this murder was a suicide. And police in Gross Point Farms and Woods would not comment on the lawsuit, but did say the investigation done was thorough and complete. I'm local Ford defender Hank Winchester, back to you. It's currently 4.08 in the Motor City. We go to the Thurswell Law Firm to check in with Attorney Gerald Thurswell. And you all remember, um, Attorney Thurswell is representing the family of a man who died at Northland Mall at the hands of security guards. Um, good afternoon, Attorney Thurswell. Well, good afternoon, Bill. How are you? Wonderful, wonderful. When I saw this story, I found it to be most interesting. Legally, what are the issues here? Well, I have a copy of the complaint that was filed in the United States District Court. What the family has asked for is, number one, that all the documents regarding this case be turned over to the Department of Justice in Washington for an investigation. Second, they've asked that um, uh, um, they want damages uh, in the amount of $1 million compensatory damages and $60 million is punitive damages. Number one is, or number one is, they have obtained a lot of the records themselves through the, through the Freedom of Information Act, and they could have submitted those documents with all the allegations in the complaint to the Department of Justice and ask the Department of Justice to investigate it. Alternatively, they could have asked the Michigan State Police to investigate this matter. Uh, they have chosen to file a lawsuit to have those things done. Um, that's a very interesting thing. The fact that they went, they went federal as opposed to going state? Well, they, why did they just go ahead and take all the allegations that they put in the complaint, all those allegations that the police officers were negligent and or were intentionally disregarded evidence, falsified evidence. Why didn't they just present that to the Michigan State Police and say, please do an investigation? Why didn't they present that evidence uh, to the Department of Justice and ask for it? I don't know why they did that. I don't know why they're, they're going to federal court and asking the court to order that that be done. They themselves could have done it, but they had, you know, they're going to court uh, to have the court order it. Whether the court does it, I don't know. You know, what I found interesting from a lay perspective was that they are alleging that two separate police departments conspired for a desired result. If you look at the complaint, they've named 19 police officers. Do you believe that 19 police officers got together and decided to falsify evidence, disregard evidence, 19 different police officers, two different police departments. I think that's hard to believe. It, it may be true, but it's just hard to believe that 19 people would conspire together to cover up a murder. That's exactly what I thought when I, when I read the material. 
I thought that it was highly unlikely you could get that many people to participate in, in a conspiracy on, on, of that magnitude. It seems to me that somewhere along the way, someone would say, I, you know, no, I will have no part in this. Interesting also, in the complaint, they allege that Officer John Doe, they're not naming the person uh, by name, they say Officer John Doe is suspect number one. And in the complaint, they're saying that this John Doe officer, uh, apparently a police officer from the city of Harper Woods, was the one who murdered their mother, Joanne Romaine. They specifically named John Doe, and they referenced that it's a police officer from Harper Woods. I think that's, that's very interesting. It's, it's very interesting. Why don't they just go ahead and say, here's the police officer's name that we believe, and just allege, we believe this person killed my mother, uh, and then submit that information with everything else they have in their complaint to, again, the Michigan Attorney General or the United States Department of Justice. I, thought, I found it to be a very, very interesting case. Now, when we come back from this break, what I'd like for you to do is walk us through legally how you handle something like this if, you know, some people would say this is a bizarre case um, and these kinds of cases, situations don't happen often. And, and that's probably true that they don't happen often. But I guess what I'm asking you to do when we come back from this break, it, you know, if, if, if someone ends up in a similar situation, how, you know, what is it they should, what, what should they do? Okay, okay, let's talk about that. 413 in the Motor City, I'm Mildred Gaddis. My guest is attorney Gerald Thurswell of the Thurswell Law Firm in the Detroit area. We'll be right back. Police departments on claims the defendants conspired to cover up her murder. Gross Point Farms resident Joanne Romaine uh, was seen in 2010. Her car with her purse, wallet, and cash were found inside a church parking lot. Investigators say they tracked footprints in the snow uh, from the lot in Lake St. Clair and, ser and searched the waters, but no traces of Romaine were found. Her body was found by fishermen in March in a channel of the Detroit Rim River uh, near Ontario. Her death has been ruled a suicide by drowning. Her family, however, says that's not the case, and they are alleging that the Gross Point Farms Police Department and the Gross Point Woods Police Department conspire to conceal the true cause of her death, and they are alleging that a police officer killed her. But what do you do if you are uh, a member of a family, head of a family, mother, father, sister, brother, whatever, and something occurs with a family member, and you have to deal with police agencies? Let's well, talk with Attorney Gerald Thurswell about this. If they can prove if they can prove that a police officer or several police officers intentionally concealed information, if they can prove that they intentionally concealed information, then they'll have a case against that officer or those officers. The case would be, one is they were gonna, they were gonna allege that they were deprived of their right to maintain a wrongful death action against the individual who caused their mother's death. They would want to sue this individual for damages, but they've been deprived of that because the police intentionally concealed information. That's one. Two is they have a right to have this person brought to justice, be charged and be found guilty. And similarly, they're entitled to damages for emotional distress that this person is walking around and wasn't charged because they concealed evidence. So those are two cases where they could obtain monetary damages. The other issues in this case that you're talking about, uh, as I uh, talked about earlier, is to ask the Department of Justice, I think they could have done that on their own. To ask the Attorney General, they could have done that on their own. This is, is, is really an interesting case, and, and for lay folk it seems a bit, for some lay folk, let me say, it seems uh, uh, a bit bizarre. Um, you know, there are so many things uh, about the legal process that we don't understand, those of us who are not in, in, in that particular discipline. Um, as I said earlier, when I first read this story, I thought it was a bit bizarre. 
uh, the allegations and also the course of action that the family members have chosen to take, but certainly that's their right to do so. Now, what I want to ask you is, in, and we're talking about something entirely different because things happen, uh, life happens. You know, if you're John Q. Citizen and you find that a family member, uh, has, a family member's death has been caused by some illegal, unlawful method, what's the first thing you do? That's a very sensitive place to be in, especially when you first hear, when you first learn the news. And sometimes, because of emotion, we tend to make mistakes. Walk us through that. What do you do? Well, of course, you go to the police, and if you feel that they, they're not being thorough, if you feel that the police are not being thorough, you have to go up the chain of command. If you have to go to the chief of police, but you go up and you present your evidence and you give them all the reasons why you think that they haven't thoroughly investigated this matter. And if you fail to get it from the local police department, then you go to the uh, attorney general of the state of Michigan and you present your case there. But you, you have to be organized. You have to give them facts why you think this, was, this investigation wasn't complete. This, this, and this should be done. But you have to be aggressive. You, you can't just sit back and say, okay, uh, I'm just going to rely on it. If you think that there was a wrongdoing, that there was a wrongful conduct, then I, I think you owe it to your family member to go out and pursue that, to push and push until you can get a result. Now, um, closer, to, closer to home and closer to families, here's my question. Um, telephone rings. And you, there, you've, you've handled, your law firm has handled several, well, high profile cases. Uh, the most recent ones uh, include the Renisha McBride case, you represent that family, and you also represent the family of Mackenzie Cochran in the Northland Mall situation. Um, I have often heard that the first couple of days after an incident occur, are the most important ones because it is at that time that you're able to ascertain or try and ascertain the the most uh, accurate facts of a situation that that um, has occurred. So you're at home minding your business, you get a phone call, and someone tell you 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 learn that a family member um, has been killed or an injury has caused the death of that family member. And we're talking about the kind of case that, that, that ends up being, could be both criminal and civil. What are the mistakes families should not make immediately? Well, I think when a family member dies, a friend dies, what you do is you have to find out who the investigating police officer is. And I think you have to be very polite, but you have to be on that officer. What are you doing to investigate this? Have you talked to everybody in the neighborhood? Have you checked to see if there was any video surveillance? But you have to be with that person. Show them how much you care that this person had a valuable, valuable life. You, you alluded earlier that um, I represent the family of Renisha McBride, the young girl who was shot uh, when she was knocking on the door of, a, of an individual in the city of Dearborn Heights. Um, that case has, uh, has obtained national publicity. I mean, everybody all over the country uh, was questioning me about it. That's just one person who died, and we had all this publicity, and it was a tremendous investigation because of the publicity. It was a black girl who knocked on the door of a white man's house. He shot her through the door and killed her. There are people killed every day in the city of Detroit. These people are just as valuable. They're brothers, their sisters, their children, their parents. But you have to find out who is the detective in charge of the case. Stay on that detective talk to them, what are you doing, what did you do today, what have you learned, and they'll share a lot of that information with you. Well, did you go ahead and talk to this person, that person, uh, stay on them so that the investigation is thorough. Let the, detective, let the detective know how important this individual was to you. What are the mistakes you can afford, that you cannot afford to make? If you show that you are indifferent, if you show that you don't care a whole lot, and the detective is not going to care so much either. It's just another murder in Detroit. How many people get murdered in Detroit every day? You have to show that this was a substantial person, a person that was important to the family, important to you, a valuable person, 
and that you want an investigation. Attorney Thurswell, what's the criteria for a wrongful death um, qualifying for a civil lawsuit? What's the criteria? Okay, if you can identify the individual, and that's the problem that they have in this case, is identifying it. If you can find, if you can find out who the individual is, and one is a person could negligently kill somebody, careless, careless use of a firearm, you could, you could sue and collect uh, damages that way. Um, if it's intentional, clearly you can collect damages for the loss of the love, affection, companionship, income, if it's intentional or if it's negligent. In the case of uh, Renisha McBride, the young girl who was shot uh, through the door in Dearborn Heights, if the individual, if it was clearly, clearly just pure negligence, the gun went off accidentally, um, of course you could sue him, but his homeowner's insurance would cover him, would cover any liability that we have. On the other hand, if it's an intentional act, then you have to go after the assets of the individual. Insurance won't cover an intentional act that results in the death of someone else. Wow, that's an educational moment there. That if it's accidental, the homeowner's insurance will, will, will be responsible for the, the civil uh, challenge. However, if it's criminal, then the assets of the homeowner. That's correct. Um, I also handled the case there was the uh, young woman who was attending a party of an off-duty Detroit police officer. I don't know if you remember it. Oh, yes. It was in the city of Detroit. And I can't read the terms of the settlement. The terms of the settlement was confidential, so I can't reveal the terms of the settlement. However, the off-duty police officer had a gun in his pants, and his shirt was covering it. The gun did not have its safety on it, and this uh, young woman, um, uh, uh, Dacia Miller, was put her arms around the off-duty police officer, the gun went off, and she died. Clearly, the officer did not intend to kill her, clearly. It was an accident, the gun safety was off, he knew the gun was concealed, it was negligence, and therefore his homeowner's insurance covered uh, the liability that he had to a nation of his family. Wow. Attorney Thurswell, thank you so much for talking with us. I wanna give our listeners the number to the Thurswell Law Firm. We're gonna give you two numbers. One is the 866-354-5544. That's a pretty good number, Counselor. <laughs> Thank you. 866-354-5544. Or you can call 313-486-0370. 313-486-0370. Once again, that 800 number is 866-354-5544. 5544. Except that the other number was wrong. It's 248-354-2222. The 313 number was incorrect. Okay, give me that again. 248-8. It's 248-354-2222. Mm -hmm. That's another good number. <laughs> did you, uh, did you, uh, how, who did you know to get that? 24, you know what? They've got this other number online. So forgive me for using okay. that number. The correct number, ladies and gentlemen, is 248-354-2222, 248-354-2222. Thanks a lot for talking with us this morning and, and, and shedding some light on this story that I thought was really a bit uh, different, uh, legally speaking. You too, Counselor, Attorney Gerald Thurswell. Thank you. Bye-bye.